AQA, A level physics, mass and energy. This bit of the specification is what we're going to do. So look at this diagram. <clears throat> On the left, we've got two protons, two neutrons, two electrons. On the right, we've got a helium atom. Now, one would expect them to have the same mass. Now, the masses of these bits and pieces, we know them very accurately because we measure them using mass spectrometers. We know them to lots and lots of decimal places. Uh, if you work it out for yourself, you will see that the mass of the bits is bigger than the mass of the atom. OK, if you work out the total mass of all the separate particles that make up the helium atom, it's bigger than the mass of the atom. It's 0 0.030378 atomic mass units bigger. Uh, hopefully you remember that an atomic mass unit, uh, a carbon atom, mass, a carbon 12 atom has a mass of 12 atomic mass units. That's the definition of that. OK. It's about 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. But the important bit here is that the bits have a bigger mass than the, than the atom. Now, why is that? And the answer is because if you imagine we started with the atom and we tore it to pieces, what we'd have to do first of all is like pull the electrons off and, and that would only take a, a few electron volts. That would be dead easy. But then what you would have to do is pull apart the nucleus. And to do that, you, you're going to have to work against the strong nuclear force. That's going to take a lot of energy to pull it to pieces. And because you have to do a lot of work to get from there to there, this system here has more energy. Yeah, the energy of that system on the left, the total energy of that system on the left is bigger than the whole atom. And because it has more energy, it has a bigger mass. That's what EMC squared is all about. If two systems are identical, only one of the systems has more energy, then it has a bigger mass. Why does it have more energy? Because if you like, the, the particles in this system have got negative potential energy and the particles on the left don't have negative potential energy. So that system's got more energy. To pull an atom apart, work would have to be done to pull the electrons away and then to separate the nucleons. So the system of particles on the left, left has more energy than the system on the right. And this difference in energy is evident as a difference in mass. I could waffle on now, do you know? Uh, somebody stood at the top of the cliff has a bigger mass than somebody at the bottom of the cliff because they've got more energy. Uh, a hot cup of tea, and I'm not talking thermal energy really. Well, I am because it's the total energy. A hot cup of tea has got a bigger mass than a cold cup of tea if everything else is identical. You know, um, a car whizzing along the road has got a bigger mass than a car not moving because it has more energy. E equals mc squared. Energy and mass are interchangeable. Now, the work required to pull an atom apart, you know, we said it takes work to pull it apart. It's called the binding energy of the atom. OK, and most of this binding energy, in fact, nearly all of this binding energy is the binding energy of the nucleus because it's so much work needed to pull the nucleus apart. And this binding energy, if you say an atom has a certain amount of binding energy, it's actually a negative quantity. OK, it's the work you would have to do to pull it to pieces. It's like, you know, if I've got an overdraft of 200 pounds, then that's my binding energy is 200 pounds. It's a negative amount. If somebody gave me 200 pounds, then I would have zero. So binding energy should be a negative quantity. It's not actual proper energy that the atom has. It's how much work you would have to do to pull it to pieces. And it's called the binding energy. 
uh, a very useful conversion factor. Uh, I said one atomic mass unit was about 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. If you do E equals MC squared uh, and you convert your difference in mass to kilograms and then do E equals MC squared, you get that one atomic mass unit is equivalent to 931.5 mega electron volts. You'd be given that in an exam, by the way. So a helium atom, we worked out the difference in mass and then using our conversion factor, we get that the binding energy of a helium atom is 28.3 mega electron volts. Strictly speaking, minus 28.3 mega electron volts. Now, bigger nuclei will have bigger binding energies because there's more particles to pull apart, okay? Uh, so the actual binding energy of an atom isn't that interesting. What is interesting and useful, as we shall see, is the binding energy per nucleon. That's the average amount of work you would have to do to pull the protons and the neutrons apart. The binding energy divided by the mass number there, or the nucleon number. Okay, and that is a very useful quantity. So for our helium, our helium was about 28 mevs. So the binding energy per nucleon is about seven mevs or minus 7.07 .07 mevs. And that's the binding energy per nucleon. Now, why is it useful? Because if we plot a graph of the binding energy per nucleon against the nucleon number, the mass number, so the binding energy per nucleon against the mass number, we get a very, very interesting graph, which you should certainly be familiar with, which is this graph here. Okay, this is the average binding energy per nucleon. Uh, why? Because it's a good measure of the stability of the nucleus. It tells you basically talking about potential wells. Uh, if the binding energy per nucleon is big, then to take each particle away, you would have to do more work. So it means that nucleus is more stable. Looking at this graph here, this isotope of iron here is the most stable nucleus, iron 56 because to pull each particle away from the nucleus, you would have to do the most amount of work, okay? Because the binding energy per nucleon is greatest. It's the average amount of work you would have to do to pull the nucleus apart. Uh, sometimes the graph, in fact, it depends what syllabus you're doing, should actually look like this. It's the same graph but it's the fact that the binding energy per nucleon is negative, okay? It's the same graph, only it's upside down, so be careful. Depends what textbook or revision guide you're looking at. It's the same graph, though. I prefer it upside down, actually, because it's a negative amount. Now, consider this. We've got a big, fat nucleus here. A big, I don't know, uranium-235, something like that. A big, fat nucleus. Now, if this big, fat nucleus splits in two, okay, two smaller ones, then looking on this graph, what's happening is my big, fat nucleus is splitting into that and that. Now, these are my fragments, my fission fragments, and because the average binding energy per nucleon of the fragments is bigger, then the total binding energy is greater. And if the total binding energy is greater, then energy is released. Okay? If your total uh, potential well, negative potential energy is greater, if your particles are deeper in the potential well, then energy must have been given off. So this graph shows that fission, yeah, this is fission is when a big fat boy splits in two. Fission is energetically viable. It could release energy 
when a big fat nucleus splits in two, energy could be released. We'll actually talk about, you know, how nuclear reactors work later on in the next video, but this is important for the moment. It shows that energy would be released. Look at this equation here. This is one of the fission reactions which could occur uh, from U uranium-235. They don't all do this. There's, there's quite a lot of different ways that it could split up. But this is a, a common example used in exam questions. So what's happening is we have the uranium-235. Uh, it absorbs a neutron. It very briefly becomes uranium-236, which has a much shorter half-life. And this, in this particular case, it splits into barium and krypton. And we also get a few more neutrons given off. Now, the point is that the left-hand side of the equation has a bigger mass than the right-hand side of the equation. Why? Because some mass we could add plus energy. Yeah, some mass has turned into energy. So the left-hand side has a bigger mass than the right-hand side. And if we calculate the difference in mass, then we can work out the energy released. Interestingly, while we're here, notice that we all also get some neutrons chucked out, okay? Uh, and that, that's basically because, do you remember the graph of um, N against Z, an important graph? And do you remember how it kind of went up like that? Yeah, so these smaller nuclei, they don't need as many neutrons for stability. So spare neutrons are naturally chucked out. And you know that they can go on and cause a chain reaction, etc., etc., as we'll see later on. So, this is the kind of thing you might have to do. I've given you the masses of all of the particles, work out the total mass on the left hand side, work out the total mass on the right hand side, work out the difference in mass in atomic mass units, uh, use our conversion factor to work out the energy released in mega electron volts. Now, are these atomic masses or are they nuclear masses? To be honest, don't worry about that because the electrons cancel on either side. OK, so it doesn't matter. You might be given atomic masses or nuclear masses. You generally don't have to worry about electrons because you've got the same amount on either side and their binding energy is tiny negligible compared with what's going on in the nucleus. So work this out for yourself and I will show you the answer in three, two, one. There you go. Yeah, uh, mass defect of about 0.2 atomic mass units works out at about uh, 200 mega electron volts. You know, in this particular case, a bit less, but it's usually about 200 mevs for a, a fission event produces about 200 mevs usually. Let's go back to our graph now. Two small nuclei come together and form a bigger nuclei. They fuse together, nuclear fusion. And looking on the graph, that could be one of these little guys and one of these little guys come together and they form a bigger one and that's nuclear fusion and again because the average binding energy per nucleon is bigger if you're starting with by the way if you're just starting with a hydrogen like a proton then the average binding energy is zero because it's on its own anyway but for the other examples of fusion with deuterium and tritium the the average binding energy gets bigger the total binding energy gets bigger, energy is released. If your binding energy increases, you're deeper in the potential well, energy is released. For example, look at this reaction. We've got uh, two isotopes of hydrogen coming together to form helium and a neutron. Okay, uh, and I've given you the masses in AMU. Uh, again, work out the total mass on the left, work out the total mass on the right, work out the difference in mass, work out the energy released. 
Uh, and again, if I put plus energy there, then you should realize uh, that this mass here on the left hand side is bigger than this mass here on the right hand side because mass has changed into energy. So work it out for yourself. I'll show you the answer in three, two, one. And there you go. About 17 and a half MEVs per fusion event. Before we go, we've talked about fission and fusion, but a lot of what I've talked about applies to all nuclear decays. In all nuclear decays, in your alpha, beta, gamma decays, it's always a move towards stability. The daughters are always more stable than the parents. Yeah, and life in general, really. There's always a move towards stability. The total mass is smaller and energy is released. For example, if you look at this alpha decay, this 235 uranium going to thorium 231 plus an alpha, and if you work out the difference in mass on the left hand side and the right hand side and then work out what we call the mass defect, you can work out the energy released. OK, for any decay, mass turns into energy. It's a move towards stability.